I ask you to join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, God, our rock and our redeemer. May we receive this morning the good news that you came to love all of us. And may we continue to be a faith community where all people are welcome and loved. May we continue on this journey where you're inviting us to be more like you and to show your love in that way. Bless our time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe that uh, this week is the sixth week of this sermon series where we've been taking a road trip through the scriptures. It's hard to believe that it's been six weeks of us visiting different places throughout the scriptures that they can be um, cornerstones, important places throughout the scriptures that are teaching us how to understand better who God is and who we are as people of faith. And again, it's just hard for me to believe that it was six weeks ago that we started, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures talking about the beginning of the, the people of Israel and, and with Moses and the giving of the Ten, Ten Commandments. And we now have gone through the prophets, we have gone through the kings, the prophets, uh, the wisdom literature, uh, and then... Um, Last week, we were able to, to have this road trip through the Gospels where we got to hear about the good news that Christ, the love of Christ, is for all of us. That Christ came not to condemn the world, but to, to save it, to, to bring it closer to God in a way where we all be forgiven and loved and experience a new life. And so now we're entering into this now part of the road trip where we are beginning to see how that message of the good news of the gospel is beginning to be experienced in real life. And that's why we have this stop today with the letters that Paul wrote. But before I get into Paul, and since we're thinking about our road trip, I want you to, 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 to stop for a minute with me, and I want you to relax for a moment, and I want you to imagine with me what would be for you the perfect vacation, okay? I want you to think about it for a moment. What would be for you the dream vacation that you wanna take? What, what would that be? Is it a cruise uh, in, through Europe? Through, around, I mean, I know that you cannot go through Europe on a cruise, but you know what I mean, like visiting the different places in Europe? Um, is it, Germany? Is it uh, Ireland? Is it Paris? I mentioned Paris last week, I don't know. Uh, is it Australia? New Zealand? Uh, is it Thailand? Go to the beach in Thailand? Um, is it the Northern Lights in Iceland? Is it Machu Picchu in Peru? Uh, is it the Patagonia? Is it Egypt? So you can see the pyramids. Is it Alaska before it melts? I just realized that I just gave you my list of the places that I want to go to, by the way. <laughs> if you weren't paying attention. Okay, so you are in that place where you are having that dream vacation. Now imagine with me that your parents, without you knowing it, they left you money to take that vacation. All paid expenses, everything, okay? Everything covered as a gift. A gift that you didn't think you were gonna receive. Would you be excited? No, I would be excited. You, I, you would be very excited. And so all you have to do in order to go on that amazing vacation is to pack your stuff. Make sure you take everything you need and show up to take the flight. And so that day comes and, and so you're all packed up and you get to the airport, you go through security, you're, you're about to board the plane and then you begin to notice that as you are about to board the plane, there are people about to get on the plane that you know. And the reason why you know them, 
is because you don't like them. Okay? These are the people that you cannot see yourself spending time with. These are the people that you don't see yourself sharing this amazing gift of the trip of a lifetime. These are the people that, for whatever reason, they are on that list of people that you do not want to associate with. And then you get on the plane, on the plane, and you happen to sit next to one of them. And then you happen to realize that they're not only going to the same place you are going, but that their vacation is also entirely a gift, all paid off. Paid off by your parents. And you're like, wait a minute. I know that I deserve this vacation. I have worked hard all my life to be a good child, a good son or daughter. I have done my homework. I have gotten good grades. I have done everything that I'm supposed to do to receive this gift. And now all of a sudden, these people are getting a free ride? Unacceptable. This is not cool. This is not the way it's supposed to be because this gift is just for me. Because I'm special and you're not. I deserve it and you don't. I want you to pause there for a moment. Because I might be a little bit over the top here in my explanation. But I think this is kind of the way the early church began to feel when they began to realize that this good news, that in Christ, God loves all the people. God really meant all the people. Okay? Because although it, re it sounds really beautiful when you hear the scripture that God loves all people, in real life, it's really hard to accept that really God loves all people. And so just think about it, because this is the beginning of the early church. This is our beginning, where you have this group of people who most of them are coming from the same faith tradition. If you want to think about it in this way, most of the people are coming from the same family. And now all of a sudden, their family has to be expanded. The family is growing. And it's growing in a way that I'm not liking it. Because it's going to include the people that I have thought for most of my life that they do not have the right to be part of my family. So think about that because as all of this is beginning to happen, that the people are receiving this amazing message of good news from Jesus. And we're be they're beginning to struggle. The church is beginning to struggle with who's in and who's out. God sends the Apostle Paul. And I know that it is not fair to try to tell you in less than 10 minutes the entire message that Paul preached. And I know that you have your opinions about the Apostle Paul. But at least for today, let's suspend all of those judgments about the Apostle Paul. And I want you to see Paul as this lighting rod that is coming in the midst of this conversation of who's in and who's out to proclaim a message that is very clear. God's grace is for all people, no matter where they came from, no matter their religious background, no matter if you like them or you don't. God loves all people, and this new faith community that God is creating not only has to tolerate them, but has to love them and invite them to be part of the family. There are 13 
letters that Paul wrote. I'm sure that you know them by heart. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, This is really bad. Okay, I'll give you a week at least to kind of familiarize with those, okay? But there are 13 letters that Paul wrote. And all of them are very different from each other. But I think that there is a common thread throughout them. God loves all people. And as much as we struggle with that... God is not taking that back. God is not taking that love. We have to embrace it. And we have to make it real. And so Paul, who already was a controversial figure, Paul, who, who was at some points a very committed religious person, above average committed religious person, he was trained in the ways uh, of the Jewish people in a very intense way. He, was, he had a, 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 a rabbi teaching him about the law. He was one of those kids who, you know, he had to memorize, but, you know, I just want you to think about this. He had to memorize the entire five first books of the Bible as part of his learning of the faith. He memorized every word, not the names of the books, Okay, it's so like Genesis, Exodus, no, no, no. He memorized each word of all those books. He knew about the law. He knew about the festivals. He knew about the diets. He knew about everything, how it needed to be done. He knew really well, about, so much that at some point, he became part of the Sanhedrin, this Sanhedrin, this Jewish court where religious controversies were uh, resolved, but also where... Um, this, um, this place where you could say it was like their, their court where any criminal cases or religious cases or civil cases were brought, brought in and, and they had a police and they can be executing. And, and all of, so needless to say, Paul was one of members of kind of like the police of the Sanhedrin so that when orders of uh, apprehension or execution needed to be carried on, Paul was one of the people, and one of the jobs that he was doing is that he was uh, rounding up those Jewish people that were becoming Christians so that they can be in prison or that they could be beat up or, in some cases, killed. But on his ways to execute one of those orders, he, he encounters Jesus. And he has a conversion experience. And God says, I need you to be a messenger to the Gentiles, to the people who are on the outside. I need you to be the person who's going to be telling and reminding the early church that all people are welcome. And I know, you know, that it's going to be hard because you are already, people are already afraid of you. You are an outsider. You are someone... You know, you're not the poster child of kindness and love and understanding. And yet, I'm calling you to be the person who's going to be bringing this message. And so Paul embraces that calling and he goes into all these churches to remind the people that God's love is for all. And you see... Um, we are removed from that time. And I think that for us, I mean, it may sound like, of course, that's a great message to hear. Until it really begins to affect that you directly, right? I remember this um, cartoon in the newspaper that I saw one day, and it was the cartoon of, uh, it, was a, it was someone where they were in court, and the judge is there, and the jury is there, and the defendant is there, and then you have the person standing up to read, you know, their, um, their decision. And the person is reading, and it says, uh, Your Honor, we find the defendant innocent. We only, the only thing we ask from you is that he, he, we don't want him to live in our neighborhood. But he's innocent. Right? 
And so the early church was, okay, God loves the Gentiles, but let's keep them separated from us, okay? Let, don't let them mess with the way we do things because then things are going to get out of control here. You know, once you begin to let that people in, you don't know how we're going to change and how they're going to do things differently. And I'm going to be very uncomfortable. So, sure, we are here and they are there. We are all happy. Just keep us separated. But that's not how things work. Because not only God loves all people, but God wants to bring all people together. No matter how different they might be, no matter how difficult they might be, no matter how uncomfortable they may make us, God's love is for all. And what you will see throughout the history of the church and these letters is this struggle between the church and the newcomers. And you see this struggle between the people wanting to control who's in and who's out. And this, those, these moments of being very uncomfortable and not wanting really to, the, the, this fights, this division, because, oh, no, no, if you want to be a, a follower of Jesus, you have to become a Jew, and, and you have to eat and follow all the rituals of the Jews, and, but if you don't follow them, then you're not really a Christian. God doesn't really love you, and, and you have Paul, no, you don't have to follow all those rituals. What you have to be is a person who receives that love and then comes into that love and begins to learn what it means to love people and to be changed and to be transformed form and you so you see the struggle and 2,000 years later I think that we continue to be in the same struggle of who's in and who's out who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it and our efforts to keep creating these divisions and 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 this um, okay we'll let you in but you have to do, do all of these things in order to be part of it and, and 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 what Paul is saying no 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 you don't have to create extra requirements you have to let the love of God flow. And our job is not to say who's in and who's out. Our job is to share it. And so these letters challenge the people, the early church, and us when we read them to be open, to let that love flow, and to really engage people and to touch people because here's the message that Paul is trying to convey to people. If this is about deserving the love of God, then no, one's, no one wins. Because no one deserves the love of God. We are all imperfect. We all fail. So why, why are we going around? I deserve it, but you don't. Remember what I told you about that dream vacation did I tell you it was a gift all free okay so that's where all of us are this faith that we have this good news that we have is entirely a gift because God is really good and we cannot control that you see, this message that Paul is preaching is nothing new. Actually, if you look at the Gospels, we begin to see Jesus warning us that this was going to be an issue. And so he tells this parable of the workers in the vineyard. And the story tells us that there's this guy who needs workers. And so he goes and finds people to work, uh, you know, to the, to the plaza. He goes and says, hey, who wants to work? And people are just, I'm, oh, please take me. I don't have anything to do. I need the money. So he goes in the morning and he takes people and they go to work. And then three hours later, he comes back and takes more people. And then six hours later, and then he takes more people. And the, maybe an hour before the end is over, he goes and takes more people. And then at the end of the day, the parable tells us that Jesus pays the people and begins, begins to pay everybody. And so the people who work all day, they get the same amount as the people who work just for an hour. Guess who's unhappy? And yet, the owner of the vineyard says, what are you talking about? Didn't I promise you a salary? Did you get your salary? What are you complaining about? You were going to be here all day. 
You weren't going to do anything. This was a wasted time for you today. And I came to give you this. You see, this is, the, this is where all of us are. What Paul is telling us is God's grace has come to overcome the walls and the barriers that we create so that people may not get to experience this love. This love. And so here we are today on this road trip where this is really taking a very unexpected turn where we really have to make room for all people. And our hope is that we will take this message and really make it ours, really make room, really create space, really be loving and excited that new, different, weird, whatever adjective you want to put to, People are coming and experiencing this love. Because it is in that fulfillment that we really encounter God. Paul did not come to preach a new message. He just was very persistent. He was just very much in your face. And I think that today we still need that. Where we can be that people that shares that love. It is a gift. Don't forget, it is a gift of grace. And our job is to let it continue to be a gift of grace so that those who are on the outside, they can be on the inside with us sharing the goodness of God. So, let's hope that this morning we will embrace that calling and that in your life and that in everything that St. Matthews do, we might be the place where God's grace is available to all. Amen.